I'll tell you what. Good morning, brothers. Today, we are going to be doing a mass production of alcohol. And then we're going to distill it and maybe get on that Moonshiner show because I think that'll be pretty cool. Now, I am in a legal area. However, if you are not in a legal area, you probably shouldn't do this. But today, we're legal, baby. And we're going to do it. So stay tuned. Because we got some good tasting, too. That is my horrible moonshine and accent, and I hope everyone forgives me for it. Other than that, please enjoy the video. Now, if we're going to do this at a big scale, we're going to need a big still. And I got one off of Amazon.com. I got a 13.2 gallon one that I could directly do fermentation in and then just distill out. Now, before we do anything, we need to sanitize our still. And I'm going to use this one-step no-rinse cleanser. Now, no-rinse cleanser is important in brewing because it kills harmful microbes without leaving residues that could spoil flavor or reintroduce contamination. All I have to do is add one tablespoon to a gallon of warm water, and I'm doing this directly in the still. All I did was make sure it was thoroughly mixed, and then I started pouring it on the sides of the still and washing anything that I'm going to use with this solution. I also switched out to a graduated cylinder because fuck that spoon, and also it's a lot easier to maneuver and pour around the edges. We also need to make sure that the graduated cylinder is clean as we need it for later. Now, I could just do a basic grain alcohol, but I actually wanted something that I like, so I decided to do a pineapple apple cider. And because I was watching so much moonshining shows, I had to get in character before I went to the store. Now, because people don't really give out their recipes for this kind of stuff because it's a family secret, I had to ask ChatGPT and they suggested to use four gallons of apple juice or apple cider and two gallons of pineapple juice. The main thing that we have to watch out for are preservatives as any preservative in our juice can actually hinder the fermentation. Preservatives are actually designed to stop microbes and yeast is a microbe. So things like potassium sorbate or benzoate can block yeast from reproducing and disrupt their membranes. And any sulfites can inhibit key enzymes, so the yeast can't build a population and fermentation stalls. Which you know is quite the opposite of what we want. We want that fun juice. How else am I supposed to be autistic with the boys? Now, I want a slightly higher percent of alcohol, so I'm going to dissolve 3 pounds of sugar into some warm water. This will raise the specific gravity of our solution, and thus giving us a higher percentage of alcohol. Now, specific gravity is a measure of a liquid's density relative to water, and it's used to calculate alcohol content by volume in brewing and distilling. Basically, it's just a calculation to see where your alcohol could be when the fermentation is done. Once all the sugar was dissolved and cooled down, I then poured it into our fermenter with all of our other juice. I then gave it a good stir, so everything's a homogeneous mixture. Like mentioned previously, we need to get our specific gravity now so we can then do it again after fermentation and calculate our alcohol content. The specific gravity that I got was 1.060 and we're going to use this in the future for our calculation. And a lot of times, people who make alcohol will use this for beer or wine and they know where to start so they get to the desired percentage. Now, before we actually ferment, we need to add sodium camptin tablets, which is sodium metabisulfite, and then some pectin enzyme. The reason why we add camptin tablets is this will dissolve to bisulfite and to sulfur dioxide, and this molecular sulfur dioxide will diffuse into wild microbes and inhibit key enzymes which stop their growth. The bisulfite also binds acetaldehyde and browning quinones, protecting aroma and preventing oxidation. The pectin enzyme is a mix of pectinases that cut and deesterify pectin polymers. And this collapses the pectin gel so particles can settle and finings work fast, giving a more clear cider, which is why we put it in here. Once we added all the pectin and camptin tablets, we're going to give this a stir so everything's mixed together, and then we're going to let it sit for 12 hours. Once the 12 hours are done, we can then move on to the next step, which will be day two. Now before we do that, I'd like to stop and give awareness to something very cool. Now let's face it, most standing desks only have two legs, and honestly, they wobble like crazy. The FlexiSpot E7 Plus fixes that problem with four legs, making it rock solid and far more reliable. 
Compared to the typical two-leg desk that can only handle around 200 pounds, the E7 Plus supports up to 540 pounds static and 440 pounds while lifting. If we take a look at Uplift Desk V2, which is a competitor, they can only do 355 pounds of lifting capacity, which FlexiSpot already beats them in that category. Even at its maximum height, 51.5 inches, the tallest four-leg desk you can buy, it stays stable. It also comes with a 15-year warranty and a 30-day risk-free return, so you're covered long-term. On top of that, it's budget-friendly. Most four-leg desks run over $1,000, but FlexiSpot keeps it affordable without sacrificing quality. It's compatible with accessories, features a keypad with a USB charger, and can handle heavy gear or even your own weight while moving smoothly. For example, Sin, Sin City was I even filled a graduated cylinder to its brim with water, and as the desk rose, it didn't budge. It was perfectly stable. Right now, FlexiSpot is running their 9th anniversary sale with up to 65% off, and even the chance to win a free order. Use my code listed on screen for an extra $50 off, and don't forget FlexiSpot also offers discounts for students, teachers, military, and more. Check out the links below and grab your own E7 Plus. You won't regret upgrading your setup. Hell, I even like it, so it must be good. After the 12 hours, the next step is getting ready for fermentation. What this means is we need to measure out some yeast, and we're going to measure out 6 total grams, and then we're going to rehydrate it. To rehydrate the yeast, I used about 175 milliliters of water, and I just used my body temperature as a regulator for how hot the water was in the sink, and it seemed to work out pretty well. Once I had the water ready, I then poured the yeast in, and I stirred it, and I waited about 10 minutes before I added it into our solution. Another really important step is to add yeast nutrients, which in our case, we're using Fermate K. Now, the purpose of using Fermate K is it feeds the yeast with nitrogen, vitamins, and minerals so they grow strong and finish the ferment. This also prevents stalls and off flavors, like sulfur or hot alcohols, giving a cleaner cider. All that's left to do is add this to our unfermented mixture, which is also just called must, and we're going to add both of these. The first thing that I'm going to add is the Fermate K, followed by the yeast. Here you can see the rehydrated yeast, and I'm going to pour this in. Now I have seen differences where people only use rehydrated yeast, and others don't use rehydrated yeast. I don't know if there's a big difference, but I do want to point that out. Once everything was added, I gave it a stir, and everything was ready for fermentation. Now, unfortunately, when this was delivered to my house, they somehow dented the side of it, and the lid fits on weird now. I'm hoping this doesn't affect the distillation, but it is something to watch out for. Now, we also have an airlock hole on our lid, and we're going to be pouring some 40% alcohol into this airlock. The purpose of an airlock is to let carbon dioxide out while keeping oxygen and other microbes from getting in, which could hinder our fermentation. The only problem is mine is not airtight, as one, there is a dent which has made the lid fit on weird, and two, they also have a port to where you add the distillation setup to, and they didn't give me a cap for it, so I had to put a piece of tape over it. This shouldn't be a big deal, as it's pretty closed off, so I'm not too worried. The next thing was to carry this big crawfish boil pot out to the garage so I could let it sit. The next step is to just let this ferment for about 8 to 10 days. A couple days in and I decided to check on the must and this is what we have. What you're looking at is called croissant. The CO2 from active fermentation lifts yeast, proteins, and fruit solids, which is pectin slash pulp, to the surface creating a froth and it's a very good sign that the yeast is thriving and scrubbing out dissolved oxygen. After 8 to 10 days, you can see our solution lost its frothy top and is now this clear solution. Maybe with a little bit of haze, but mostly clear. What we need to do now is check the specific gravity to see where our alcohol content is. Using the hydrometer, we can get our specific gravity. The final specific gravity that we achieved was 0 0.9940, which is less than 1. What this means is that our cider is less dense than water, which also means that all of the yeast have eaten most of the sugars and made alcohol, so it's basically a dry slash finished product. What this means if we do the calculation is this is about 8.6% alcohol by volume. Now the alcohol is still a little hazy for me, so I want to use something called super clear. 
Now, SuperClear is a two-part fining agent that's used generally in winemaking and cider making to make alcohol clear and bright. Now, part A, or packet one, is kesosol, I know I mispronounced that, and that's a negatively charged silica solution. It will bind to positively charged particles such as protein and yeast cells, clumping them together. Kytosin, which I hope I pronounced that right, is a positively charged solution, which is generally derived from shellfish, and it binds to the negatively charged particles and also to the kesosol protein complexes, making them heavier so they drop out more efficiently. I followed the directions on the packet, it did some magic, and boom, we have a much clearer solution. I used a shot glass to make it easier to see, and you can see that the super clear did its job quite well. Now, before I distilled anything, I also wanted my own personal stash, so I decided to siphon some out of it and put it into a milk jug. Now, once I have this jug, I can now add preservatives. Potassium sorbate in Campton tablets will stabilize the cider by preventing yeast from restarting fermentation and protecting it from spoilage. It's now time to distill what we have, and we need a propane stove, so I got one off of Amazon. I also tested it, and yeah, it, it definitely works. First things first, I need a bucket of cold water, as this will help condense the alcohol as it comes over. This is the Viver 13.2 gallon setup, and I had to watch a random video on YouTube to figure out how to do this because they didn't give me instructions. Now the first part is the boiler barrel, which is this pot, and this is the main 13.2 gallon vessel for heating the wash. The next step is called a thumper, which is a smaller secondary chamber between the pot and the condenser that performs a speech distillation step for higher purity and stronger proof. Basically what the thumper does is the incoming vapor condenses slightly, heats the liquid, and causes it to revaporize, effectively achieving a secondary distillation pass inside the thumper itself. Next is the condenser keg, which cools down the vapor into alcohol via this copper coil. These two valves are for water circulation, so we can cool down that copper coil. And finally, what we have here is this little spout, and it's often just called the spirit outlet or where you're gonna collect your higher spirit alcohol. Now, it's very important before we actually start the distillation that our copper coil is submerged in the cold recirculating water. Once I had all of that done, I then turned on the propane stove and our distillation began. I decided to put a mason jar under the spout so we could collect our first fraction, which will be called the heads. When our distillate started to come over, this is what we're gonna collect and actually throw away. The heads are the first portion of alcohol that comes out of the still. They contain lighter harmful compounds like methanol, acetone, and ethyl acetate, which smell harsh and taste like solvents. We throw them away because they're unsafe to drink and would ruin the flavor, leaving only the clean, smooth hearts for drinking. Now normally, how much of the heads you throw away is about 100 to 150 milliliters per five gallons. Now I use 4.5 gallons as I save two of them. Now I think I personally did around four to 500 milliliters, which is definitely excessive, but I just wanted to make sure since my girlfriend would be tasting this. Now before collecting the hearts, I did run into an issue where everything was coming over quite hot and a lot of vapors were being produced. What I did first was switch this out so we could start collecting the hearts as the heads are officially over. All what that means is I just put a new mason jar underneath the spout. I then continually pumped cold water into my recirculation bucket and this seemed to help out a lot. Immediately upon flooding the system with colder water, no more vapors were present and we had a steady flow of our moonshine starting to come out. Now all I had to do was keep collecting until it wasn't clear anymore and then once it started to become cloudy, that's when we have our tails. You can also tell when the tails are coming, when the smell is different or the taste is slightly oily and coats your tongue, and the proof of the alcohol starts to fall steadily. All that's left to do now is just let this distillation run and I'll stop when the tails come. This is the collected product that I have and on the right you can see our hearts which is very clear and on the left you can see our heart slash tails. I did end up collecting a little bit of tails into the left jar, so that's why it's cloudy. Now the left jar would probably be used for redistillation just in case, so I probably wouldn't drink it. Now we can't do the specific gravity measurement, so we have to use a hydrometer that can show the percent of ABV. With this heart fraction, we got a total of 52% ABV, which I think is pretty good. Now in case you're wondering how this works, you just fill a graduated cylinder up and you put the hydrometer in. What we're measuring now is the tails portion. 
Our heart slash tails fraction did come out to 40% ABV. That makes sense as tails does have a diminishing percentage of alcohol, so it is a little bit less. You can also tell by the appearance that there's tails in this fraction as this one's a lot more cloudy than our hearts fraction. Now, I really wanna try both of the products that we made, one, the pineapple apple cider and the moonshine that we made. And with the aesthetic request from my girlfriend, I put this onto a flight board. Not only did she give me the advice, she will also be joining me for the tasting. So, let's get into the tasting. <clears throat> <Okay. laughs> That's interesting. I'll tell you what, buddy. We're gonna be tasting some moonshine. Is that, is that an acceptable intro? Um, <laughs> that's an intro for sure. There comes our dog out here. Anyway, we're going to be tasting what we did. <laughs> and there's the dog. Mia wants to try it too. <laughs> she wants to try it. You want to try some cider? Can I say cider? <laughs> it's, it's water, guys. It's just, it is not alcohol. It is purely water. Uh, according to YouTube, it is purely water. And ATF too. Uh, but yeah. We can try it out now, and we can let my beautiful, wonderful, amazing girlfriend try it first. You, you gotta give your comments though when you say it. Okay. Well, let's cheers. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, we can cheers. We can cheers. Do you have a toast? I'll tell you what, guys. The moon shining. Hear the clink? That's not too bad, as you would say. I, I, she may be faking it. Let's get the real, uh, real answer from her. It's pretty good. I like that it's not super sweet. It's not sweet, guys. It's like more dry. I did not sweeten it. There's no back sweetening in this. Well, back sweetening, back sweetening of the water. <laughs> but it's not dry where it makes you like dehydrated or thirsty. You ever had like a really dry cider where it just makes you like want water immediately after? Very important point she made. <laughs> <laughs> Next, off to the moonshine. For YouTube, it's water. But the moonshine. I'm scared of this one. What is it? I said I'm scared of this one. Ah, uh, don't be. It's just water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, a little clink. We'll just take it fast. Oh. <laughs> it's some strong water. I think it's an alkaline water. My, my, I think they put a little bit of electrolytes in there. It's so smooth, the moon would be jealous. <laughs> it's, a little, it's some smooth water. But it's okay. That's it. See you later. <clears throat> <coughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's not bad, though. It's not great. Well, don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> I think an alcoholic would love this. <laughs> okay. We're bringing this to the AA meetings. Me, who I like things to like hide the alcohol, mm. you know, it's too much. It's like a shot. Remember, this is water, but we're just saying that the strength of the water is very, very, very large. Yes. And you hear it here, folks. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> okay. I'll drink more of the cider, though. Okay, yeah. <laughs> 